Hey everyone, Retire here. For the past two years, Glitch Hunters Fleeter Kiari, Map, Martmist, and myself have been working on a game breaking exploit in Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. A glitch known as Arbitrary Script Execution, or Ace in short. Some of you may be familiar with a glitch with the same name that was found by Malio and solidified gaming for Paper Mario TTYD. And similarly, this glitch allows us to run any event or script in the game's scripting language allowing us to not only credit warp, but get any item, Pokemon, and even arbitrarily overwrite memory at will. This video will explain exactly how this was achieved and what our next goals are with this new exploit. In order to achieve any sort of code or script execution, you generally need two things. A way to write a payload to memory, which tells the game what to do, and a glitch that allows you to execute that payload. In the case of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, there's been one glitch, which I actually share my name with, that held the potential to achieve this, the Retire Trick. The Retire Trick is a glitch originally discovered in 2017 by a glitch hunter known as Ganix. Ganix found that if you could load the player into the Park map, it would run a map script that gives the player the Park menu, and at the top of this menu is the Retire function. When pressed in the intended map, it gives the player the option to return to the hub of Power Park and leave the minigame. However, the script it executes is actually based on the map the player is standing in, allowing for other scripts to be executed simply by standing in a different map. The player could abuse this by entering the void, which is the out of bounds area of the game, and then entering the Power Park map to get the menu. By then going to another map, you could load a script of that map. One of the most known scripts is the battle against Arceus, which was also discovered by Ganix. After Arceus was first obtained for this method, people started to play around with the retire trick in different maps around the game. There were a few rare instances where people would suddenly credit warp, and I even managed to start a glitched battle and get game over screens. At the time, this wasn't reproducible nor understood but it showed major potential. The only thing we knew for certain is that these effects were somehow tied to using the retire trick in maps containing less than 4 scripts in runtime. In 2019, a glitch hunter known as Fleeter Kiari decided to investigate how the effects occurred. She discovered not only exactly how the retire trick functions, but also how it led to these not yet understood effects. The way the menu functions is by executing the fourth script and runtime. Let us give a short rundown of how this works internally. Every map in the game contains a list of scripts which can be run inside of the map, by talking to NPCs, walking over triggers, or some even by simply entering that map. Each script exists out of multiple script commands, like start a battle, or open a text box, and so on. The moment any script is about to be executed, all the scripts for that map are loaded into memory, along with an array that contains offsets. These offsets are essentially indicators of where the scripts are located in memory. The first offset in the array corresponds to where the first script in runtime is located, the second index where the second is located, and so on. When loading a script in runtime, it'll go to the address of that index in the array. It'll take the offset, which is a 4 byte value, and add it to the address that it's located at. This newly formed address will be the start of where the game starts executing script commands. For the retire trick, it will always run the fourth script in runtime, which means it will grab the fourth offset in the array and add it to the address of that offset. Now, it goes to where the script resides in memory to execute its commands. A script is composed of multiple script commands, which are 2-byte instructions directly corresponding to a function to be executed by the game. These can also be followed by parameters. For example, to start a battle you need the wild battle script command, followed by the species ID and the level of the Pokémon you want to encounter. After finishing a command, it will continue reading the next bytes in memory as script commands. There are two main ways to stop the execution. 
The first method is to use the end script command, which will immediately stop all execution. The second method is to use invalid script commands. When the game reads an invalid script command, it will also stop execution. So far, all we can do is execute scripts that are pre-written by the developers. But if we could somehow break free out of the intended scripts and execute our own script commands, this would essentially give us total control, or arbitrary script execution. And that's where the next thing that Fleer discovered comes in. Earlier, I mentioned some strange occurrences. Specifically, in maps with less than 4 scripts in runtime. Well, that's because in these maps, when pressing retire, you're reading the offset to the scripts past the array containing offsets. After all, there are no scripts to have offsets too. Now, the data past the array will determine the offset to the script commands it has to execute. The data present past this array are the script commands of the first script. It would read these script commands and jump way further in memory than intended. This could be potentially game-breaking, if it didn't come with some caveats. Since the jumps are based on script commands of the first script, there is absolutely no control over them. If no accessible jump lands anywhere in memory that we can control, we'll never end up getting ace. Martmus and I worked together on further understanding how this data was allocated in memory and we wrote a script to dump all the jumps to memory that were available. Quickly, we realized that we were quite restricted. While we do have a total of 348 maps that have less than 4 scripts in runtime, there are a lot of duplicate offsets being read from the script commands. If we group these, we end up with only 56 distinct offsets. We refer to these as offset groups. After dumping all of the jumps, it was time to look for potential memory regions we could write our payload in. After about two weeks of searching, Map and I found that using the retire trick in Map 390 would jump to backup save data, which seemed very promising. It jumped to the structure of berry bushes scattered around the overworld. By planting berries with certain IDs, and waiting for specific amounts of time, it would be able to write wild battle followed by any species ID at level 1. This setup was tedious to say the least, but theoretically it was possible. And so, Ace was found. Well, if that is the case, then why exactly are there still 20 minutes to go in the video? Turns out, while this perfectly worked in an emulator, this did not work on real hardware. The jump you are using doesn't technically jump to real backup save data. Where it jumps to is backup save data in a copy of main memory. You see, on emulator, it is possible to read past the main memory, and it will allow you to execute from what essentially acts like a copy of main memory. A real console, however, doesn't allow reading from this memory section, and attempting to crashes. That meant that of those 56 map groups we had, only 30 were actually within valid memory regions. And of those 30, only 19 didn't land within ROM, which is data you cannot control. Of the remaining jumps, 11 landed in texture, chunk or model data, which we can barely alter. This cut it further to 8 groups. And all of those groups landed inside data that was overwritten by opening and closing menus. Meaning the retire menu would override it, before we could execute it. So it seemed impossible. But then, suddenly, Fleeter Kiari returns to the scene. She had figured out that you could use Alt Retire, a different glitch that also executes scripts, to jump to useful data. You see, Alt Retire occurs when you catch 6 Pokemon in Paw Park mode, 
but instead of this running the fourth script in runtime, it runs the third script in runtime. Turns out, there is a section of memory where Hall of Fame data is copied to when viewing it inside of a PC, and we could jump to it. Immediately, I started working on getting control over this memory region, and within two days, I managed to write a jump to anywhere in memory by using the level of a Pokemon followed by a specific PID, a value that we can change through RNG manipulation. For this setup, we would need to transfer six Pokemon from the Generation 3 games, which meant that this form of Ace was only possible if you had a copy of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, a Gen 3 game, and the Nintendo DS Lite to transfer the Pokemon. But many of us felt like requiring Gen 3 assistance was kind of cheating, so I decided to go back to the retire trick just one last time. I checked just to be sure if there was any jump with the retire trick close to this section of memory. That's when I discovered something by pure accident. There was a minor mistake in the dumping code which would, under very specific conditions, dump the wrong address for the start of execution. Before I mentioned that the data passed to the arrays are script commands, and that those are read as the offsets to jump to memory. But there are two maps, map 332 and 333, that are a bit special, in that they only have one script, and that script is just two script commands. Come direct enter battle room, which turns the screen black as a warp transition, and end. This meant it had one valid offset to the first script, then a terminator and the first script command as the second offset, and then the second script command as the third offset. Meaning the fourth offset would read past the script commands entirely. This wouldn't be an issue for the dumping script in itself, except the data here changes to a new value right after execution, from OX5544 to OX4652. The script would simply assume it's OX4652, but the offset is read at the moment that it's still OX5544. And turns out, this is incredibly close to the address used with the new alt retire setup. It also landed in the Hall of Fame data. All of a sudden, Ace was not possible in a single game of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. I quickly altered my previous setup to work with the new execution point, and it works. But maps 332 and 333 have a fair share of issues. First of all, these maps are considered Wi-Fi accessible areas. This wouldn't be an issue, except that all Wi-Fi accessible areas are treated as mystery zones, in which you can't open your menu. Except on the Japanese version of the game. On those versions, you can open your menu in any map. There are also methods to open your menu on the international version, which are currently not very practical, so for now I will only focus on the Japanese version of Ace. A second issue was the map script for these maps. As mentioned, the only script they have is comdirect enter battle room, which turns the screen black. So we'd need to get our screen to not be black. Luckily, once inside the map, we can execute script commands, so we could simply execute commands OX101, which reloads the screen for us. So now, most of our issues are actually resolved. You would need to enter the Hall of Fame a total of 30 times for this setup, to fill the gallery far enough to read from it. With a specific PID, you would jump to the calculator output and be able to write your payload there. Even for a tool assisted speedrun, this would take 3 hours to perform, just because of the amount of Hall of Fame entries. 
and I wanted something faster. The memory section we were using can actually load different data than just the Hall of Fame data. I found out you could actually write item data here. If you enter a battle with certain overworld trainers, it copies your items to this section of memory. This would be very difficult to use, since the first items it jumps to are key items, item IDs you have almost no control over. But after the key items come TMs and HMs, then mail, medicine, and then eventually the ball pocket. If you could reach one of these later ones, maybe we have enough control to jump to somewhere else in memory, and then from there jump to anywhere in memory. So we need to get past the key items by falling through them. Falling through means we set up data in a way that the game will perform instructions that don't crash until we actually reach data that we can fully exploit. At this point in the game, the journal, town map, works key, the explorer kit, bicycle and the fashion case are all mandatory items. Unfortunately, three of these, namely the journal, works key and the explorer kit, crash the game. We can't remove these items since they're key items, so is there any other way to prevent these crashes? Earlier I mentioned that script commands can have parameters. If we could read the crashing IDs as parameters instead, you'd be able to get past them. In order to skip one item, you need at least 4 bytes worth of parameters, since every item is followed by an item count. The key items always have a count of 1, so we can't control the item count, meaning we're restricted to only the IDs. Luckily, there are actually 3 key items that have multiple parameters. The VS Seeker and the Town Map take 4 bytes each, enough to skip one item. And the Coin Case takes 6 parameters, enough to skip 2 additional items. This would be enough to skip 4 items in total. We only need to skip 3, but we'll also skip the fashion case, which opens a text box when executed. This would be very annoying to deal with every time you execute. Using the void glitch, we can get anywhere in the game, and easily sequence break to only get these items early. The next data are HMs and TMs. At this point in the game, you need cut and rock smash, and turns out that cut crashes. Luckily, now we can buy TMs and use the item count for a TM to set up a script command with multiple parameters. By buying 4 protects, it is possible to bypass cut and fall through. Now we reach the mails, which we can just have no items in because there's no mandatory mails. And we fall through to medicine. By buying 416 paralyzed heals, you'll jump by OX1A0. At this point, we land on the item count of the second ball in the ball pocket. If this item count is 25, you will write player dirt jump, which is a jump that only occurs if the next value is the same as the direction you're looking at as the player. By having the next item be either 339 ultra balls or great balls, corresponding to looking left or right, you'll then jump OX15300 bytes to address OX22B5B91 which is battle data. This battle data we jump to is quite interesting. First, it loads the structure of the opponent and your own data. And after that, any action you take in battle will add more data to it. Some actions like fainting the opponent or swapping Pokemon will write your own PID followed by the opponent's PID. Since we can control these with RNG manipulation, they should allow us to jump anywhere. Without any action taken, the PIDs will be written at address OX22B5834. This is a difference of OX35D bytes. We can only change our allocation by 4, so we can try to allocate the data at OX35C bytes further, and start reading the first PID from the second byte onwards. By opening and closing menus, we can add data to this section of memory without any RNG involved. To reach OX35D bytes of data, we can perform the following actions. Open and close the fight menu 3 times. This will add OX138 bytes. 
We then open and close the bag twice. This adds an additional OXFO bytes. Then you open and close the Pokemon menu twice. This adds OXF8 bytes. Now open the Pokemon menu once more, which adds the last 3C. And this will total to OX35C bytes of data. After swapping to any Pokemon, the PID of the Pokemon you originally sent out, followed by the opponent's PID, will be written to the exact bytes we jumped to with the item data setup. Before this battle, we'll need to do a bunch of setup, so keeping our Ngman up up to this point seems near impossible. Luckily, there is a way to set the PIDs beforehand. When releasing a Roamer Pokemon, the PID is generated at that moment and it remains unchanged regardless of how many times you encounter it. Therefore, we can first manipulate our own Pokemon's PID and then the Roamer's PID before doing any setup. Now, just as a recap, what we need to achieve is a trainer battle to load the items into memory. Then, we need to encounter a roamer, which we already have the PID for manipulated. And then, we need to allocate the PIDs of our own Pokémon and the roamer Pokémon to where we jump with the items. After all of this setup, the game will be able to jump anywhere to memory with a retire trick if it's used in maps 332 or 33. By setting up our PIDs to specific values, we can jump to the calculator output. I gave maps some potential PIDs that allow us to jump to the calculator data at address ox 2384 8 p 5 He used a script which spat out thousands of potential combinations of valid PIDs that could be generated within the game. And this only used one of the jump commands, so there are probably tens of thousands more potential combinations out there. With the calculator output, we can then write our payloads and achieve arbitrary script execution. However, we still need to somehow reach the ballpark maps and maps 332 and 333 to execute scripts. Considering that the battle data will be overwritten by opening any menu, we can save reset as this would clear the memory. We're essentially limited to moving around. Can we somehow reach the void while in the overworld by simply moving around? Well, maybe if you could somehow get walk through walls. And this is where ledge cancelling comes in. It's a glitch that I found in 2019, which has many applications such as storing and moving chunks, opening menus and maps you can't, wrong warps, and even walk through walls. There are tiles in the game known as ramps. When you're on your bike, the game allows you to cross over them if you have enough momentum, and the player will fly a couple tiles in the air. If the player could somehow open a menu while having specific subpixels, things would start to break. The only way the game prevents you from opening your menu is by assuming that you'll always require momentum to go over these ledges. Because when moving, the game doesn't allow you to use the menu. However, with the help of glitches, it's possible to stand on top of these tiles. In which case they'll still move you, but not stop you from opening menus. While moving in the air, the game moves the player relative to the map. But when opening the menu, you can desync the player's coordinates relative to the map. If you do this enough times, eventually the X coordinate of the player and the X coordinate of the map will desync so much that the chunk calculations start to break. At which point, you essentially gain walk through walls. To get this ledge, we can use a glitch known as tile writing. At the top of a map in the void, at specific locations, the game will read tiles above the intended map data. It will read, for example, pointers or leftover data in memory. It is possible to manipulate these pointers into being a ledge tile, but with a collision value below 80. Any collision value below 80 is considered a walkable tile, and above that is considered unwalkable or a wall. So, if you write one with a collision value below 80, you can simply walk on top of the ledge and use the menu 
by then ledge cancelling about 130 times, the game will make the entire overworld into void. We can then go back to the overworld and get the trainer battle. Now, we only need to encounter the roamer, so that we can jump to the calculator. But the game now considers us inside of the void, so how can we get an encounter? The game only considers us in the void when we're walking around. There are actually completely independent calculations for a chunk position when you reload the map through graphic reloading. When performing a graphic reload where the grass tile should be, the game will consider you in that grass tile until you move at which point everything will be considered void again. You can turn around without leaving the tile to get the encounter. After the encounter, we are no longer allowed to open any menus, because it would overwrite the battle data. But we can continue walking through the void. At a certain point, we can read our map ID from map-related data and memory. By loading NPCs, warps and other objects, we can eventually write any map in this section of data. We manipulate this data into writing a ballpark map, which gives us the ballpark menu required to use a retire trick. And then, we manipulate the map 333, one of the maps that we could use to jump to the item data that we loaded into memory. As mentioned before, the moment we enter map 333, the screen will go black, and we can simply remove it with command OX101. Before we enter, we set the calculator to 131,329 times 256. This will write OX101 followed by 02, which is end. We enter the map, execute the scripts that we wrote, and now we can start writing any script command that we want. We can easily credit warp by writing for example 175 times 256. But this was never really the goal. A little more impressive is to be able to get any Pokemon. For this, we can use add the Mago, which gives the player an egg. If the player gives themselves an egg with the species set to Manaphy, it will automatically convert it to a real Manaphy egg. So we did it. We can give ourselves any egg with this, or any item, or infinite money, but we can do a lot more than just that. Gen 4 scripting language allows you to read and write to registers, or write any byte to memory. This in itself is already incredibly powerful, as it allows us to essentially do anything, but Martmist took this one step further. He realized that script commands are loaded to memory and they execute assembly instructions. So what if you overrode a script command's instructions with arbitrary writes, and then executed that script command? You would be executing custom assembly instructions. This isn't just arbitrary script execution. This is arbitrary code execution. So try meshing d-pad and... Uh... <gasps> it actually is changing the data. Okay, hold on, try holding... But what happens if you hold uh, like A, B, and all D pad buttons? Right. And now, Void Matrix presents arbitrary scripts and code execution in Generation 4.
Um, hey, retire here just one last time. Before we leave off, I'd like to say a few words. First of all, this video was a huge crunch and it's 2am right now. Um, we wanted to publish it on the release day of the remix of Diamond and Pearl, so I'm sorry for any issues that slipped in. But next to that, I also want to give a huge thanks to everyone involved in the project, especially Friedrich Yari, Map and Mark Mist. And I'd also like to thank you, as the viewer, if you've made it this far, and that's just incredible. In case you have any further questions about the setup, or want to be involved in Gen 4 glitches, you can always join the Void Matrix Discord, where all of this took place. Or for Pokemon glitches in general, you can join the Glitch City Research Institute. Both links will be in the description. Well, until next time, see ya!